Okay, so today um, we're going to talk about a whale tale, the evolution of whales from terrestrial mammals. My name is Brooke Lane. I'm Leon Pierre I'm Scott Hedda. Ben Bird. Bird. Alright, so <laughs> the first whales evolved over 50 billion years ago and they were first terrestrial mammals and then they switched or evolved to be aquatic land mammals or aquatic um, mammals. Um, the fossil records have shown that they have um, evolved less than 15 million years ago. These mammals belong to a diverse group called the Cetacenes, um, which are carnivorous marine mammals. Um, Cetus means um, large sea creature in Latin, and in Greek it means sea monster. Paleontologists have found that um, these uh, animals were in rocks in India, Africa, North America, and Pakistan. The earliest ancestor was found in Pakistan called the Pakistetus. Okay. Well, some fossil evidence about the Pakistetus is the oldest cetacean from the Eocene period. Um, it has a well-preserved cranium that was found, which shows it was definitely a cetacean with its narrow brain case, high and narrow sagittal crest, as well as its prominent lamboidal crest. Um, it did not have sinuses or other hearing adaptations of modern whales, um, it, which allowed it to not hear well underwater, and thus it was incapable of diving. Um, it was more terrestrial than aquatic in this area, but the shape of its skull was definitely a cetacean. Um, its forelegs and hind legs were functioning for walking. It had no tail flukes, as well as his nostrils were far forward. Um, its simplicity of the premolars indicate that its teeth were adapted to hunting fish. Um, its teeth were between ancestral and modern states. Some features of the skull suggest an amphibious lifestyle. For example, the eyes on top of the skull. Um, it was small, but no skeleton is known for them. And then the ear bones show a feature unique to whales placing it as the earliest known member of modern whale lineage. Just to like show a comparison of like how far the whale has come in evolution, the Pacacetus was about the size of your average like savanna cat, like a tiger or a lion. And the head shape is one of the key evolutionary features that really shows us like how far it's come. So this is the skull of the Pacacetus. It's about a foot and a half long. The nostrils are here at the front. And over time, as we get to the modern whales, we can see that well, obviously, the mouth and the head are much, much larger, and the nostrils are moved back to the top of the head to become the blowhole. All right, the next one on our timeline is the Amulocetus. The Amulocetus came from the Middle Eocene era, approximately 50 million years ago, and it was called the walking whale. Um, the Amulocetus looked like an alligator and had well-developed well, well feet and limbs. Well, the Amulocetus was clearly cetacean, but it had functional legs and skeleton allowed terrestrial walking. It could not have been a very efficient walker because the femur did not have large attachment points, so it probably only could waddle like a sea lion could today. Um, its skull was quite cetacean with its long muzzle, reduced sigmatic arch, as well as its tympanic, tympanic boa. Um, it apparently lacked a blowhole, but other skull features qualified it as cetacean. Um, its postcranial features were clearly an adaptation to the aquatic environment. Um, its forelimbs were intermediate in structure and function. Um, its ulna and radius were strong, and they were capable of carrying the weight of the animal on land. Um, its elbow was strong as well, inclined rearward, making swimming possible. Um, its wrists were flexible, unlike most modern whales. And then toes to the back feet were terminated in hooves, advertising ungular ancestry of the animal. And the cervical vertebrae was long, so it must have had a flexible neck. And moving on to the Myocetus, um, this lived a little over 47 million years ago. It was interpreted as amphibious whales that rested on land, but lived and hunted at sea. The skeletons were found very much intact in the Habib Rahi rock formation in Pakistan. Um, it's significant because of how well the skeletons were preserved, with over 90% of the bones from males that were found intact. Um, the skeletons were found among fossils of sea creatures, which obviously suggests they lived in sea. Um, its hip bones were strong enough to walk on land. Its short legs and long flat fingers and toes made it difficult, however. Um, its middle ear bones matched that of modern whales, and then the fore snout was starting to elongate, which is found in all modern whales as well. And then moving on to the Dorodon, this was of the late Eocene period, around 35 to 36 million years ago. This represents a group most likely ancestral to modern whales. Um, it's fully aquatic and lacked the elongated vertebrae and was smaller than other organisms. Um, its cranium was vaulted and did not yet have the skull anatomy for echolocation. Um, its size and lack of limbs made the Dorodon an obligate aquatic mammal, which means they were not able to move around on land at all. Um, the skeleton was unlike other Eocene cetaceans in that it is immediately recognizable. And then it's stream, it has a streamlined form, short neck, forelimbs shaped like flippers, and a strongly reduced hind limbs. 
So this is the ancestor that is most similar, yet the oldest, to the modern whales. And that is because just of the, the uh, nostrils have moved more to the top of the head to become that blowhole. It's fully aquatic. It's not relying on gulps of air. It's not going on land anytime soon. And uh, one of the key features that we found was its hind limbs have fully retracted into the ventral body mass. So like right here, you can see little prongs sticking out, but they're not functional at all. They serve no purpose. They're just there, just hanging off. And like, this is a picture of a modern, um, a modern whale. And the, this is where the hind limbs retract into. So they actually, as they progress, they pull into the ventral side of the body. Okay. And then finally, we had the Lanocetus, which lived during the late Eocene, around 33.9 to 38 million years ago. Uh, much of what is known about this comes from an endocast analysis, which is a cast of brain activity. And then part of its jaw was excavated in 1974 to 1975 from Antarctica. It's a very large animal with a 6.5 foot long skull. Um, it has deep grooves in its teeth, which would aid it in catching plankton probably. But also it had teeth throughout its life, which most likely used for filter feeding. Um, the spaces within the cheek teeth were large enough that diet probably also consisted of larger items such as invertebrates and small fish. Um, the fossil analysis suggested the evolution of filter feeding lifestyle. And then specializations that protected the brain from changing pressure, which meant it could go into deeper water, and then it has a blowhole at the top of its head. All right. And for model, modern whales, the whales that we see today, they can um, be categorized in two groups, tooth whales and baleen whales. Um, modern whales have streamlike bodies with a compressed neck vertebrae. They have dorsal fins, and their tail is structured um, like a fluke-like fin. Um, their skulls are elongated, and like Ben said earlier, their blow holes are at the top of their skull. Um, their fore forelimbs are specialized to create um, their flipper. And um, once again, you don't see the hind limbs at all. So they do not protrude um, externally throughout the body. All right, so we found a video that kind of correlates with the progression of these, of the whale over time. All right, so that's your pachycetus, your terrestrial, very, Significantly smaller than the modern whale today. It could swim. It was located near water, fed near water. And this is the Ambulocetus, which was more of an alligator-like animal. It could also like walk on land, but it was found more often in water. Seems like it's big hind feet. Yeah, very powerful hind limbs. Okay, this is uh, an actual transitional organism that we did not cover. We focused on the Myocetus, but it, this one can be found on the biodynamic curve. Well, it very similar to the Myocetus. So it relies on gulping for air, but it's still mostly aquatic. And then that's the Duradon, which is the fully aquatic version of the ancestor. High limbs are gone, blood holes at the top of the head. It's living full time in the water. thought that was actually a pretty yeah. good representation awesome. of a progression. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have to stop it. Okay. So one of the key pieces of evidence that we found that shows that whales came from terrestrial creatures was an embryological evidence. So in the womb, whales can be found to have teeth, hair, hind limbs, pelvic tibial and rib bones, external ears, and defined phalangeal bones. And as they progress in stages of the womb, these features slowly either become less prevalent or completely disappear from the external like, view. And uh, the teeth will subtract or contract into the gums to form harder gums. Most of the hair will fall out after birth as they continue to grow. The hind limbs are retracted into the ventral body mass. Pelvic and tibial bones are still present but are either not prevalent or non-functional. The ribs are still there and function normally. Uh, some uh, and the phalangeal bones mold together into the, body, or into the bone mass that becomes the flippers. And this is just a giant piece of evidence that really shows us how a 60 foot whale has come, or could possibly have come from a like, six foot hairy terrestrial creature, like the similarities in the embryo. So. Okay. Then, just some other forms of evidence with molecular evidence. Um, whales should be more similar in their molecularity to groups of animals with which they share a more recent common ancestor. Multiple studies show that whales are more closely related to ungulates, specifically hippos, genetically, which is consistent with the evolutionary expectations. You can just see this on the phylogenetic tree right here. 
Um, although there are minor differences in detail, all these molecular studies that have been done have produced the same result. Um, the evident pattern of bio biochemical similarities is strong evidence of this common ancestry. And then for comparative anatomy, that this definitely tells the same story as the fossil evidence that has been discovered. Um, you can clearly see the progression over time of species are becoming more aquatic from their terrestrial environments. Um, the blowhole, as Ben and Leander have said, moves to the top of the head, the evolution from the front of the nostril and pachycetus. Um, the axis of foot symmetry in fossil whales falls between the third and fourth digits, which is characteristic of mainly whales and ungulates. Um, the anvil of middle ear is morphologically intermediate um, between modern whales and ungulates as well. Um, the fossil teeth from the earliest whales have lower ratios of heavy oxygen to light oxygen, indicating they drank fresh water, which this shows the transition from terrestrial habitats into the saltwater environment of the ocean. Um, the shape of the skull also changed over time, adapting so the whale would be better able to drive and, or to dive and withstand the pressure of the deeper water. And then ultimately, all this evidence comes together to show the evolution of whales clearly from terrestrial animals. Right. Another piece of um, key evidence that links modern whales to their ancestor is the evolution of the ear. Um, this was really important because the ear um, of the earliest whales um, functions in a similar way to that of land mammals. So how it works is basically sound is transmitted through the airflow external auditory meatus or the outer part of the ear and causes a tympanic membrane or the eardrum to vibrate. Um, these vibrations go through a series of small bones in the middle ear and then um, the last portion or the ossicle goes through um, the stapes which um, acts as a piston which um, the vibrations go through the inner ear with the um, inner ear fluid causing sound. Uh, what they showed in the pachycetus was that um, it functioned in a similar way but it was more adapted to water um, because of small transitions within the ear. What they found, um, paleontologists have found uh, fossil evidence that showed that the tympanic bone wasn't connected to the periodic. The periodic um, is a capsule or a shield um, that protects the inner, um, the inner ear. So this caused the thicker side of the tympanic to vibrate separately from the periodic which made it um, better quick for aquatic lifestyle. In addition to that, um, the, when underwater, they could use bone conduction, which was um, vibration being passed through head tissues, so they could hear through that way too. Um, the only thing with that, they were more um, adapted aquatically, but they could not um, have directional hearing with bone conduction. So we know how physically and anatomically these whales have evolved, but we haven't talked about why. Um, the why of how mammals return to the sea necessitates the physical and ecological factors of the marine environment. Um, physical factors include salinity, depth, circulation patterns, and most importantly, ocean temperature. The ecological factors are solely the abundance and availability of food. Also, we're taking into account the proximity to water's edge and the predator-prey relationship. So the ocean temperature contributes dramatically because um, the terrestrial animals could have used it in their favor to cool off if they were overheated or for um, hydration. Um, with that being said, they were also familiar with the proximity to the water's edge because um, they were acclimated or adapted to breathing in the salty air and they also fed on small organisms that washed up on the shore. The closeness to the water could have contributed to the transition and made it easier to transition from land to sea. Along the lines of food, um, the availability and abundance of food is the main hypothesis of why um, terrestrial mammals evolved into marine mammals. Um, this is important and it's dependent on the trophic levels and the primary production rate of the primary producers. In trophic levels, Cyrenians, fully aquatic herbivorous animals such as manatees, um, primarily feed on the primary producers while whales and sharks, carnivorous, um, marine mammals feed on five or more trophic levels removed of primary producers. Um, the primary production rate is dependent on factors such as light intensity, season change, geographic area, grazing pressure, water temperature, and nutrient abundance. The main ones would be light intensity. Um, that has to do with the photosynthesis and the ability to reproduce in a quick way. Um, geographic area, their proximity to the equator. Grazing pressure would be a very big one because um, if the manatees and the um, herbivorous mammals are eating them more than faster than they can produce, then um, there's no point to produce them. Um, and nutrient abundance in the bottom of the ocean for them to produce off of. 
Lastly, the predator-prey relationship varies greatly from land to sea. Um, the predators that were once on land are no longer there if they're in the sea, which creates a food abundant, abundant predator-free environment for these mammals, um, which gives them a chance to like, flourish in their own environment and not have to worry about a predator above them. Um, not only do the marine mammals vary from terrestrial animals, but they've also varied from them, their own selves in the water. Um, this is due to the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. The ACC mixes nutrients in the Southern Ocean and um, accounts for large amounts of diversity because of the types of food that it mixes in the ocean. Um, with the diversity of food comes the diversity of these animals and the adaptions, mainly in their foraging behaviors. The foraging behaviors um, in the Myocetism, um, forage in different ways than the odontocetes. Um, the first ones, they filter large amounts of small fish through their baleen, or also called a broom. Um, and the other ones, they use biosono location to locate groups of vertically swimming plankton in order to feed off of. And this can also cause changes in the cause changes in the food webs and food chains, which causes a disruption in the environment. Um, with all this being said, the combination of the proximity to water, the predator-prey relationship, the physical and ecological factors can um, account for mainly the reasons why that these animals went from the terrestrial land into the marine environment. So we thank you for diving into the deep end with us and exploring this complex but very fascinating evolution. Wait, 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 wait. Well, let's have those. We might have questions. Anybody have questions? So you mentioned the transition from the nose being like on the front of the face to the top of the head. Mm -hmm. Where on your little timeline there, like... Does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here you can see that the nostril is at the tip of the nose. Right mm -hmm. here, the nostril is actually located more centrally in the middle part of the nostril. And coming here, it's almost above the eyes. And then once we get to the duridon, it's completely above the head. Also, this right here is a good representation. This was the Pachycetus, which is the first one, and this is the modern gray whale, and you can see where it was on the front of the nose, like almost like a dog or like, in, like a wolf, and then now it's on the top of the head, like a dolphin, or what we know as the whale. Thanks. Do you all have any idea, and I don't, what the kind of size difference we see in modern whales in terms of like the well, smallest to the this is a person right here if you want to look at this as a person compared to that whale but did you, did you have the measurements i just didn't know Are you talking like, about what, like in all modern whales well i'm just thinking like like how different is like the smallest whale from living well to like the largest living i just don't have any idea yeah, how we different they really the, the modern no, that's okay sorry i was just curious <laughs> was anybody surprised about the relationship with the hippos with the closest living relative What other, I mean, can you think of any other animals that you would maybe think would be? Right. We actually found, we actually found in another study um, that we ended up not using that sheep are also very closely genetically related to whales. Mm -hmm. The difference with hippos, which it surprised me, but like they are an owl group and they evolved like on their own and haven't really changed or evolved much since they, you know, created their own species. And you can see how the whale like has so many more of the hippos, it's just like an Excellent job.